Welcome to the Real Estate Investor Podcast. I'm your host, Gary Lipsky of Break of Day Capital. I talk to leading experts to discuss a wide range of subjects to educate investors on best-in-class practices to build legacy wealth and positively impact communities. Let's jump in. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Investor Podcast. I'm your host, Gary Lipsky with Break of Day Capital. Be sure to join our Facebook group, Asset Management Mastery, where we have a great community of thousands of like-minded individuals sharing resources and best practices. Hey, everyone. We have launched the BODC Multifamily Impact Fund. Invest with a trusted operator with a track record of success. Our fund offers diversification, risk mitigation, tax benefits, and stringent acquisition criteria. If you'd like to learn more, head over to our website at breakofdaycapital.com. Choosing the right insurance coverage for multifamily properties isn't that complicated, if you know who to talk to. At the Garzella Group, we're uniquely qualified to help you navigate the range of policy choices you have, and we're committed to saving you 30% in the process. We do intensive market research and have nationwide relationships, so we can find coverage other insurance brokers simply can't. We should talk. Go to quotenow.biz and we'll start the conversation. Today on the podcast, we have Brian Boyd. Brian is a real estate investor and tax attorney who focuses on how to use real estate and the tax code to help build wealth. He is the author of Replace Your Income, A Lawyer's Guide to Finding, Funding, and Managing Real Estate Investments. Thanks for joining us, Brian. Can you start by telling the listeners a little bit more about yourself and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm an attorney. I grew up here in Tennessee. I went to the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga and earned my BA in 1998. Um, and then I went on to law school at Sanford University in Birmingham. And from there, I matriculated to Georgetown and got a master's in tax law. Uh, then I worked at Ernst & Young in Washington, D.C. Uh, they called us consultants at the time, but we were basically there to do business law things. So it was a great experience, but I'm now back in Nashville and I have my own firm. Uh, I focus mainly on real estate, construction, business law, and tax. Um, I have an associate that he pretty much handles most of the litigation for us. We do a lot of real estate litigation and a lot of construction litigation. But uh, a few years ago, probably in 2017, I had uh, an opportunity to sell another business I owned. And from there, I leveraged into uh, short-term rentals. Uh, my wife's a full-time W-2 at a pharmaceutical company working in the science space. And I'm self-employed. So it was the perfect fit of using the short-term rental loophole to be able to take the tax benefits of real estate while not having to spend 750 hours a year in that. And you know, I'm happy to explain that to everybody. But now I have uh, social media and I try to educate people on real estate and taxes and how to use them hand in hand to create generational wealth. Or if you're not interested in creating generational wealth and you just want to put your kid through college without any student loans, I'm happy to show you how to do that. Or if you just want to take that extra vacation, I'm happy to show you how to do that. So that's kind of where I've been the last few years, just really teaching people about, hey, you know, there's some really great benefits here. And by the way, it'll kick out some cash for you every month that you otherwise wouldn't have. So yeah. it's a pretty good marriage. Well. Uh, glad to have you on. Let's let's jump into that short term loophole right now because uh, you know I got a lot of friends that invest in a lot of different uh, things, and so we're always looking to obviously follow the the letter of the law and, and reduce your taxes, uh, you know, the right the right way. So let's talk about that short term loophole. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's not really a loophole. It, it's in the Treasury regulations, and it falls under the passive activity loss rules under Section 469. And it's actually Treasury Regulation 1.469-1TE32A. So that's a lot to get out. <laughs> but basically what that section does, and just to distill it down for the listeners out there, is you can buy a short-term rental. And if you spend 100 hours a year and that 100 hours has to be more than anybody else working on your properties, including you know the maintenance men, uh, the, the cleaners that are turning the unit, then that activity will make 
that short-term rental active. So it takes it from the passive activity bucket to the active activity bucket. So if you're a W-2, you can actually use the tax losses associated with uh, that short-term rental and offset your W-2 income, which a lot of people really enjoy because it saves you taxes. Not only are you making more in cash because the short-term rental is generating cash every month, but you're also getting the deductions from depreciation, cost segregation studies, and bonus depreciation, as well as your Section 162 business losses or expenses, is another way to say it, uh, to offset your income. It's a great way to hack the tax code. And not only do you have an appreciating asset that's paying for itself and the tenants are paying down the note on it, it's also going up in value. So you have an appreciating asset that's paying you and it's providing, uh, providing these other dividends in the way of tax deductions that you otherwise wouldn't be able to take. That's really interesting um, because, you know, I feel uh, a lot of people are try- trying to hit that 750 mark uh, and it's re- it's really hard um, if they have a full-time job elsewhere. And you're, and you're saying if even if they have a W-2, they could still take that and make it active and use it against a W-2 income. Absolutely, you can. Uh, so what you're talking about is real estate professional status, and that's under... Uh, it's still under Section 469, but there is no loophole to it. You actually have to spend 750 hours a year materially participating, not just you know looking at houses online or listening to podcasts. You actually have to materially participate in the management of the property. The problem comes in if you're a W-2, you're, the IRS says that, hey, as long as you're a W-2, we consider you a full-time employee there. And so you're going to have to exceed whatever your full-time hours were. So let's say, for example, you work 1,800 hours at your W-2 over the course of a year. Well, in order to be real estate professional status, you have to spend 1,801 hours in real estate. It's it's kind of an insurmountable pitch to get up. You just can't get up it. And this loophole provides working men and women with an opportunity to get your foot in the door of real estate and generate that money and start building your portfolio. So along the lines of the book, you start tacking these on one, two, three, over the course of two, three, four years. Now you're starting to generate enough work that you are going to hit the real estate professional status, but you're also replacing your income at the same time. And quite frankly, when you take back control of your life through real estate, the sky's the limit. The sky is the limit. I mean, I thought I saw a, uh, a statistic last week, 80% of all millionaires historically in the United States have been made through real estate. So I saw on your one sheet that um, includes your bio, you had a, a question, what is the number one thing many rich people will not tell you about? So I'm curious what that answer is. Yeah, it, it's actually how to use the tax code to your advantage. Um, so the tax code, we all know it. it. It's statutory, right? And we all dread it, but most people don't think about it until April 15th or October 15th, depending on where you fall in that spectrum. But if you start January, one thing like, ah, oh, how can I utilize the public policy drivers in this tax code to achieve what I want, then it really becomes your friend. So a lot of you know high net worth individuals, they have somebody like me on call or they have a CPA or an accounting firm that walks them through every month. Like, what are we doing this month? What's your cash flow look like? What did you buy? Because when it comes to December 31st and like I'm I'm self-employed, as are you, you know, and you're looking at a tax bill, well, what do you do? You should have had those conversations back in June or July. And so what you can do at that point is, well, if you're into bonus depreciation, go buy a vehicle over 6,000 pounds gross vehicle weight. It's a, it's a quick write-off, right like that. But you may not need another car and you surely don't want another payment. So you need to talk to people all year long. You need to Educate yourself on your money because this is how you keep more of your money. In fact, by using the tax code, you will pay less in taxes as you pull in more real estate and grow your personal wealth. 
I know that sounds axiomatic to people, but it's not. It As you generate more and more of a real estate portfolio, like through your company, for example, you're generating more cash, but you're also generating more deductions. And now deductions doesn't mean you've got losses. It's a paper loss. It doesn't mean you're cash negative because real estate will make you cash positive. It's the tax code that you use to make yourself tax negative. And that's where you want to be. That's the sweet spot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we we take full advantage of that uh, of of cost segregation, bonus depreciation. I'm, I'm be interesting to see. Uh, you know, everyone seems to think that they'll they'll pass the uh, the new law. It's, I guess it's a matter of when um, yeah. they will. But uh, uh, we 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 shall see that. But that'll be that'll be nice to go from um even 60 back up to 100 and then back into 2023 getting that full 100 and, and going forward for a couple of more years yeah i mean i would be restating my tax returns just like that i would just go back and amend and restate and do the cost segs and get it all back but to that point you know it, it was a bipartisan bill to pass the ways and means committee um which i think the house definitely recognized this is this is an important economic driver we need this my understanding is that on the Senate side, it's it's running into some roadblocks vis-a-vis the child tax credit. They'll get that worked out. It's too important to leave it because if bonus depreciation in that section 168K goes away, it's really going to have an impact on small businesses. And when I say small businesses, I'm talking about $100 million and below. You know, that's a small business in the great pantheon of mergers and acquisitions. That's a small business. So, yeah, you need that kind of economic driver to keep the wheels turning. And quite frankly, mom and pops like me, uh, and not, not to call you mom and pop, but you've got a big portfolio. It's an important aspect of how you determine whether or not I'm going to buy that and I'm going to cash flow it. And, oh, as long as I can bonus depreciate, I can roll that loss. It's really important for how you analyze the entire portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, there's so many different options to invest in real estate. You know, how does an investor decide what type of real estate is is, is best for them? Well, as we've talked here, you know, we've kind of focused this towards, you know, those that are working in a W-2 and the best way for them to utilize real estate is to get a foot into a short-term rental. Now, Airbnb was down significantly last year. I know I've got three of them and it major impact to us. But at the same time, once you get those Airbnbs rolling, then you move into other things like self-storage or long-term rentals or multifamily. I love multifamily. You know, we've got three multifamily units right now. We're doing a 1031 with some of our short terms and we're going to flip back into multifamily just because it's so stable and you can count on that money and the cost segregation is tremendous with it. So I love multifamily, but if you're just getting in, you know, just like everything, you know, do your homework, figure out what you want. Because if you get into long term rentals right off the bat, you're a landlord. If you get into a short term rental, you know, you're you're a host for maybe a weekend. And it's a big difference. And quite frankly, the barrier to entry is a lot higher on a short term rental just based upon how they work. But if you can get that first short term, you'll be set. And, you know, it's an easy way to ease into real estate management. So how do you find really good rental properties worth owning? Well, I live in Nashville. There's no meat on the bone here. I'm just going to be completely honest. It, we're we're full. Um, but I look in areas 45 minutes outside of a major metropolitan area. I look for the bedroom communities. So when I buy real estate, I look for, okay, where is the the normal commuter going to at night? Not a lot of people want to live in Nashville. Heck, I don't live in Nashville. I live in Franklin. And we're 20 miles away from Nashville. But it spills over and we have people commute every day into Nashville. So it's a good bedroom type community. But I wouldn't even buy in Franklin. I would go farther south. 
I would go another 45 minutes down the road to like Columbia or something else where the housing prices are a lot lower, significantly lower, in fact, uh, but I can still get decent rents. You can still buy a $300,000 you know, house in Columbia, Tennessee. Um, you can't do that in Franklin. You definitely can't do it in Nashville. So I, I draw a circle about 45 minute radius around a major metropolitan area. And I look, I look in that outside of that 45 minute radius, because that's about a normal commute time for most people. It's about 30 to 45 minutes. All right. And, uh, Every real estate investor has a horror story. You know, they've made a mistake or why not? I'm curious, what is uh, what is your uh, horror story and, and how could someone avoid it? Well, uh, it's a real horror story. Uh, we had a murder. We had a murder in one of our properties. And I even did an a Instagram or a TikTok video on it. And I was talking about how we handled it. We didn't find out until like seven days later when the tenant's mother emailed us. And I was like, oh, my God, is she OK? Uh, turns out she was perfectly fine, but she invited her boyfriend over and he invited his brother over and they were drinking and smoking and playing cards. And they got into an argument. One brother pulled a gun on the other one and shot him four times, killed him. So we had to deal with transitioning her out of the house. We had to get a, a biohazard unit to go in and clean the house. We pulled the. Pulled the flooring out, pulled the drywall out, replaced all of it. Uh, we had a bullet hole in one of the windows. We had to replace the window, um, but it was a it was a topsy turvy month for sure. I uh, ended up having to go to court. Uh, fortunately, I'm well prepared for that. But you know, she it caused about ten thousand dollars worth of damage, and this is a you know, we we try to provide nice, affordable housing to people. So she was only paying like a thousand dollars a month, and so that it's going to take ten months to recoup that. Uh, the fortunate thing is, we use a company called Say Rhino. It's it's a security deposit insurance, and we were able to make a claim. They paid us out. We got everything taken care of, and we got it up and rented again. And now it's it's got a great tenant in it, and it's running along just fine. But it was a true horror story. Um, somebody died. Clearly, the tenant was at no fault for it, but she did abandon the property. So we had to talk about that. It's like, hey, you know, you can't just leave. A little communication is better than none. Um, so it was a it was a mess. It was a headache for a while. That happened, I want to say last January, January of 2023. So it was a mess. For all you uh real estate investors out there, you know. <laughs> If you do this long enough, you, if you have enough rentals, one day you're gonna have you're gonna face a death on your property. I mean, it, it happens, and uh, unfortunately, it's just something that uh, you have to deal with. And luckily, uh, I mean, you you hire someone else to take care of it. You don't have to do it yourself. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, it's 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 one of those things. Yeah, it's uh, it was crazy. Um, like I said, my wife and I were we're just normal people, and you get a call. There's been a murder. You're like. What? Okay. So uh, definitely took us for, uh, knocked us for a loop for sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's, there's issues, you know, whether it's a, uh, it doesn't have to be a rough, a rough area. It could be even in a nice area. These things do happen. You know, people, unfortunately, you know, pass away or get into a, get into a fight or, or, or whatever. But, um, but yeah, that's the, uh, that's one of the, uh, the things about uh you know being a being a landlord yeah and i'm sure we could swap stories all day long you know you tenants just they will do some crazy things and you're like what made you think that was a good idea but you know they do it you you deal with it you move on and hopefully you can stay you know in the black and you know create that wealth that's all you're, you're all you're hoping for absolutely what uh when did you get the bug for real estate what was the the driver so this is a this is a pretty good story i represent a lot of developers and i have this one developer this guy could sell ice cubes to eskimos he is incredible um but he had a business partner and they brought me in to do some structuring and i'm looking at how his business partner was running things and how he had planned it out and you know Really smart guy, used to work for Carlisle and company, so good brain on him. 
And I started looking at structure and I was like, well, you know, if you overlay some tax strategies here, you can really take this to another level. And what he was doing was they were building 10 units, selling seven and keeping three and then doing um, cash out refis on those with the tenants paying down the notes and they're making money every month. I think they were going to like 60% LTV on it, but they're pulling out a good chunk of change because they're developing the property themselves. Um, and I'm like, well, have you thought about cost segging this and then applying bonus depreciation? And this was back in the cost seg came to me. I want to say in 2013, I was like, hey, if you do this, you can do it this way. And then if you structure these this way, you know, you can take advantage of, you know, more Section 163 interest deductions and, you know, just taking that. And then um, that was in 2013, 2014, 2015, 2015, I was out with one of my clients. We were turkey hunting and um, he owns coin laundries. So he bought a company out of receivership after he graduated from Vanderbilt's Owen School of Business. And that company sells industrial grade washers and dryers. So he sells to hotels and dorms and he set up his own laundry businesses. We're talking about the benefits of it and depreciation and how that works and how you can use cost segregation to really accelerate it through and then bonus depreciation depreciation over top of that. And I was just blown away. So I cashed out my four, I cashed out my sub is what I did. I took the penalty on it, but I knew I could make it back through the depreciation. It would shelter. And so I did that. And after a year, and that was in 20, so I took it out in 2015, built in 2016 and sold it in 2017. And, you know, I sold it for like a multiple of four. So I was thrilled. My wife at that point was like, what are you doing now? And I'm like, well, I'm going to do four things. I bought her a new wedding ring. I paid off a student loan. I bought some more shotguns because I was turkey hunting when I did this. Um, and I bought my first short-term rental. And that was in 2017. I sold that short-term rental a year later for a $75,000 profit and did what we call a slow man's 1031. So I didn't identify within 45 days. I didn't go to a third party intermediary. I just took the money and we bought 13 single family homes in one, one go and got them all rented and started depreciating, sheltered everything, got it all back. And we were cash flowing. Uh, that was in 2017, 2018. And now we have been as high as 33 properties then we reversed 1031 down to 22. Um, so we've kind of had a really interesting journey along the way, but that's how I got into it. It was a, a client got into it. And so I was like, well, do it this way and look at the benefits. So you got to put pen to paper. You got to make sure it pencils out. And, you know, it, it was just an idea that I was kind of bouncing around with a client one day. And I was like, I need to do this. Like this will make money while I sleep. It'll appreciate in value. I can then go do cash out refis, pull the equity out and go do it again and again and again. And that's what we've done. We play with bank money now. You know, we're not writing personal checks. We'll just go to the bank and say, hey, I want to do a, a cash out refi. Give me half a million dollars. I found this, you know, multifamily property I want to go buy. So that's how it's working now. It's really great. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. And I, I've got, you know, I know some people that are really smart at what they do and and they they come to me and they're like, I paid off my mortgage. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. I'm like, why? It's right. free money. Why? It's, as yeah. long as somebody else is paying the service on that note, don't you shouldn't care about the interest rate. And I was saying this to a mortgage broker today. I'm like, don't worry about the interest rates. It's a section 163 deduction. What do you care? It's just another line item deduction for you. As long as you can cash flow that property. And this is exactly what I said to him. If you can make $100 a month in this environment, and then when rates drop, you do a cash out refi and get to a lower interest rate, you're going to cash flow that much more. What are you worried about the, the interest rate for? It, it's going to go down and you're going to get your money back. And as long as you can stay positive through all of this, you're not losing money every month, you're good. And he's like, yeah, that's an interesting way of looking at it. I'm like, well, that's how you have to look at it. You know, We're in that kind of cycle right now where it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. I think it's going to come back down, probably Q2, Q3. But, you know, I wouldn't worry so much about it. You know, it's just part of the cycle. 
buy while, while while it's inexpensive and then you can uh refi later when things get more when prices get more expensive because rates have come down i'd, I'd rather buy now but um absolutely yeah. money's made right now like if you can get in now while these interest rates are where they are and you can cash flow what's going to happen when those interest rates drop i mean you're just cash flowing that much more and you could scale it, it, it's a if you as long as, long as you can understand the the ebb and flow of the market system that we are working in within real estate, you're going to kill it. You're going to kill it. Well, Brian, I appreciate you coming on the show and adding a ton of value on real estate tax tips. Uh, please tell the listeners where they can find out more about you. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on Instagram at uh, Brian T. Boyd. Uh, I'm also on TikTok. I have a Facebook page, Brian T. Boyd. And, you know, I'm happy to you know chat with anybody. I love talking about real estate, love talking about taxes. But quite frankly, I'm here to really be a resource for people. I'm not here to pitch my book. Um, but what I want you to do, people out there, is learn about this. Don't be afraid of the word tax. As long as you can figure out how to use it to help yourself, you're good. You're really good. Well, this is Gary Lipsky signing off. I'll be back next week with another informative episode on the Real Estate Investor Podcast. To all of our listeners, thanks for joining us. And if you like this episode, please head over to iTunes or Stitcher and like, subscribe, and leave a review as it will help us reach more people. And if you'd like to learn more about what we do at Break of Day Capital, head over to our website at breakofdaycapital.com and sign up for our newsletter and fill out our investor application. We'll talk to you next week.